Although this motorcycle journalism thing is all about keeping an open mind, using your experience and natural inquisitiveness to examine and assess each new model with a dispassionate, critical yet objective and fair approach, sometimes, with the best will in the world, it simply isn't possible. You know what it's like, the longer you ride bikes, the more experiences you amass and those experiences tend to be either positive or negative and very rarely indifferent and like it or not, they stay with you. About 15 years ago I had a fabulous holiday in a heatwave afflicted Tuscany with my wife and a K1200 GT. Even loaded with a passenger and plenty of holiday luggage, the K12 was a spookily capable, surreally rapid beast considering its fairly enormous size and heft. Fast forward a couple of years via the improved K1300 to late 2010 or early 2011 possibly and BMW is hosting the world's biking press in South Africa, my adopted home country and naturally the magazine I work for cracks an invite. The occasion is the launch of a bike that will ultimately be the replacement for the K1300 and it is the K1600. I spend most of the day slipstreaming my South African colleagues at improbably high speeds, enjoying an engine that was in the process of establishing itself as one of the greats. Two fantastically memorable riding experiences that will stay with me until the day I die. Joined by a third that involved the bagger version of the K1600 that arrived about five years later and instantly endeared itself to me for being so extraordinarily silly, yet also so brilliantly entertaining. It is said that the Germans don't have much of a sense of humour. The K16 bagger is proof that that is in fact complete and utter nonsense. And so now, in 2022, I'm spending some quality time with this, the updated version of the K1600 GTL. Yes, my history with BMW's top multi-cylinder touring machines means I can't help but approach my week with this bike in any other way than full of warm, fuzzy feelings about this touring behemoth. But times change. Bikes change and I have most definitely changed over the past decade and a half, so I'm fully prepared for the spark to have possibly disappeared. Let us begin though by examining the star of the show, this stonking great engine, and let's do it in an appropriately German way. First, some numbers. 2022 sees the same six cylinders as always, combined for a total capacity of 1,649cc to produce 160 horsepower that now arrives 1,000 rpm earlier at 6,750 rpm. Peak torque has increased by 5 newton meters to 180 newton meters, and that is available at 5,250 rpm from a motor that has an indicated 8,500 rpm redline. Apart from some ostentatious badging that does its best to tell any gawkers that there is in fact a six cylinder lump lurking behind all the aerodynamically efficient bodywork, this wonderful and unique to motorcycling piece of engineering is a largely anonymous visual element in the K16's impressive overall presence. From the seat, those numbers mean many important things, but none of them quite as important as the fact that you'll be smiling widely and frequently when you ride this bike. From the moment when you first fire it up, <laughs> and that instant bark kind of settles down into a background, slightly menacing hum. And then when you pull off and go through the first couple of gears and realize that there's absolutely no vibration nothing at all and you find that quite surprising so you slow down put it in second gear and then just Oh, open it up to check out the vibration! <laughs> and forget about the vibration and, and yeah, 
and realised, bloody hell, for something that's the size of a small castle, it's pretty quick. Yeah, this might be an engine that's designed for a touring bike, but it, yeah, I think it's more in tune with being an engine for a touring car. And since I'm in Germany, it would be rude not to head out on the highway, so to speak. The GT may be able to easily run up past the 240k an hour mark if memory serves, but this full dress version's top speed is quoted nearly as over 200 kilometers an hour. Suitably vague and I feel in need of some verification. Okay, that's uh, in fourth. 180 or so. I think maybe I have a bit more screen. That's uh, 210, 11 in fifth, changing to sixth. Well, I say. Quite calm, smell something, bit of clutch, 228. Oh, and it feels like it's hitting a limiter at, yeah, 228. 226 have set up. Put the screen up a bit. Screen down a bit, making any difference. Well, that's uh, <laughs> that's proper BMW uh, understatement. Over 200 kilometres an hour, sir. It does. Uh, well, yeah, 228. Uh, that's more than I thought it would do. I have to be honest. I thought they'd have limited it a bit earlier than that, but um, lovely stable, calm, does not feel like 228 kilometres an hour. Mind you, this doesn't feel like 100 miles an hour either, 160 k's an hour and then accelerate in top gear, 170, 180, 190, 200, 210. <laughs> what a thing! This engine, it really is a thing of wonder. Still as impressive now as when I first experienced it just over a decade ago. The mid-range is really an everywhere range kind of thing. It'll just wake up, start spinning its turbine-like veins and quite rapidly begin to gain speed. At low RPM, it takes a few seconds to get into its stride, but anywhere above that, it's already straining at the leash and smooth, like no other kind of engine. Even your super creamy inline fours feel coarse and crude by comparison. This is the internal combustion world's closest impersonation of an electric motor. Linear power delivery, torque everywhere, so smooth as to feel close to being combustionless, and yet it also has a really endearing soundtrack. Oh, listen to that. <laughs> oh, the quick shift is just brilliant. And these revs. Oh, I don't know if you can hear that in the airbox. Oh, that's just beautiful. <laughs> Welcome back. I've been riding BMW's latest K16 GTL and have fallen in love with its exceptional engine. Moving on, the engine may be the obvious star of the show, but there is another miracle worker in the K16 mix, and that is the bits that are all hidden from you, but actually keep you on the road. More than that, they keep you enjoying the road, in spite of the 358 kilo weight that suggests you should really barely be surviving the experience. There's a cast aluminium frame hidden behind the fairings, to the rear of which we find BMW's power lever system and an alley single side swing arm housing the shaft drive. At the front, although a cursory glance suggests a beefy set of traditional forks, we have the duo lever system that is also basically a swing arm hanging off the front with a single shock to take care of the suspension. The advantage of this complex bit of engineering is that suspension, steering and braking forces are kept separate and that can only be a good thing on a bike as big, heavy and rapid as this. Well, I say it can only be a good thing, but obviously if it was a rubbish 
implementation of the concept then it wouldn't be but it most definitely is a good thing because this bike handles like something that's half the weight half the size at higher speeds and with a few bumps and dips thrown into the mix you might reasonably assume that it's going to become something of a white knuckle ride but it simply isn't okay you may get a bit of swaying and shimmying just a little bit but it's never off-putting and to be fair it's probably your own fault I've done it myself look down at the dash and then you've noticed that you've left it in road mode so what you need to do is give the mode button a quick prod which you can actually do on the move put it into dynamic and then the suspension stiffens up quite noticeably and that really does help keep the weight in check and makes the whole package feel improbably even more sporty and then as a bonus with the dynamic mode you also get the sensation that the throttle has had a dose of sniffing salts or something because it's even more eager to make the six cylinder engine do a bit of work ah <laughs> it's not work it's just pleasure that's all it is pleasure with a tinge of this can't be real can it perhaps even more impressive is the way it handles at slower speeds like here on this ridiculously one vehicle wide road it's slow it should feel awkward but it most definitely doesn't in fact it feels entirely easy and normal and like I'm riding a big scooter or something basically apart from the slight increase in torque and the earlier arrival of the horsepower peak all this is pretty much as it has been since the bike first appeared in 2011 what has changed for 2022 is mainly in the electronics department and nowhere is the update more glaringly obvious than here in the cockpit where look the traditional clocks have gone in their place is this slab of plastic that might look a little dull and underwhelming when it's off but when it's on well just feast your eyes on that TFT acreage what we have here is a TFT screen that first appeared on the RT and it quite simply makes every other manufacturer's screen look cheap and nasty by comparison let's just admit shall we that BMW has currently got everybody well and truly beaten when it comes to this stuff even the smaller but equally useful items you find on the rest of BMW's range show all the opposition how it should be done come on now it's time the likes of Triumph and Ducati raised their own games to compete the only one I can think that currently gets close is an unlikely contender when you think about it the rough and ready to race bunch from Austria who have some decent screens on their biggest capacity models with the familiar BMW scrolling wheel you can twirl and prod through a huge array of menus that control everything about the bike and even for a technophobic moron like myself it's all largely logical and easy to get to grips with my favorite function by far is the ability to have a split screen display for the sat nav and rpm although posh cars have had this function for quite a long time now this is the first time i've seen it on a bike and it's very useful you need the bmw connected app on your smartphone to make it work but i did so without any outside help so it really must be idiot proof i'm generally not a fan of supplementary sat nav units on many bikes because they end up so close to the rider that my aged eyes can't see them clearly without reading specs but the display on the K16 is large enough and far enough away not to make that an issue. As I said earlier, I already had warm and fuzzy feelings about this model before I rode it. And now those feelings are even warmer and fuzzier. This is a technology laden flagship of a motorbike that shows off the engineering prowess of its manufacturer, not with 
outrageous top speeds and barely believable lap times, but by making the seemingly impossible feel very ordinary. The fact that a huge beast of a touring bike like this can be so fun, so easy to ride, is at times enough to make you question your own grasp of reality. It really shouldn't be possible to pack this much into a bike and still ride it without some kind of special training and a super heavy bike license or something. This thing makes me smile and chuckle away like an old hobo every time I ride it. It's a two-wheel contradiction, a rolling oxymoron and a motorcycling anachronism that is surely destined for extinction in the not too distant future. It is brilliant, but silly, capable yet also complete overkill. And I am actually very impressed that BMW is still making it. If you want one, I'll guesstimate the price for you since BMW SA doesn't list it. So I presume you'll probably have to order one. About 490,000 Rand base price, I would have thought. And in the LE trim that includes the two-way quick shifter that you really need on a bike like this, how's that not standard, by the way? That's beyond me. But anyway, with the LE comfort package and with the options that are on this bike, you're probably going to end up looking at something like 550,000 Rand or so. Given the steep price tag, is it the perfect full dress tourer? No. There are some details that I do find annoying, including regarding this bike's very raison d'etre, and that is, of course, long distance comfort. So if you want to hear about those or find out some more details that I've simply run out of time to discuss here, then please join me on our YouTube channel where the truly nerdy bikers amongst us, including me, of course, can examine this glorious motorcycling folly a bit more extensively.